So listen, the first question is always an obvious one, but always a very, very good one, especially when you're having an installment that comes about 11 years after it's the prior installment. So Joel, what made this the right film to take Puss in Boots to the next level, which this movie absolutely does? <laughs> Thank you. The, um, you know, it, it's... It's crazy because it's been so long since the last movie, and and I think DreamWorks, rightfully so, was very focused on we're not going to just release a sequel until it's it's the right story. Um, I think for us, like in our early conversations, th this idea that Puss in Boots is on the last of his nine lives, um, it's so absurd. Like, the, it, and it feels like ripe for a fairy tale that cats get nine lives. And as we kept talking about it, we're like, but underneath that, it's about him realizing he has one life. And as human beings, we're all just gifted with one life. And like, this could be a really like absurd and poignant story. And it just felt like it's so relevant to, to tell now about appreciating what we have. So. You know, you talk about, yeah, that one life uh, and if you go, wow, this is really existential. And to use the words existential for a DreamWorks animated movie <laughs> it is, a, is a pretty big deal. So Mark, like when it came to the tone of the film, the more mature tone, the existential tone, what kind of conversations did you have with the filmmakers, with DreamWorks, and with Universal to ensure that everyone was on board for this? Yeah, and it was... Um it is, and it gets dark, as we know. It, yeah. it's, it's, it's dark for an animated movie. Um, everyone seemed to naturally be on board, and there was definitely moments where we would be putting sequences up, and we thought, I don't know about this one, because that's our process, as we work on the script, but then we work on the sequences, and we show them to our executives in the editorial suite, and you don't always know what they're going to say, but every time we put something up, and we would be nervous, they would be like, Yep, yep, it's great, keep going. Yeah, it's great. And so we were sort of surprised as well that we were given this license, but I think it does come back a little bit to what you were saying at the start. We weren't just cashing in, of course. We wanted to make something that we felt kind of pushed the film to a new direction, kind of broadened it a little bit, and by making it this kind of dark journey, this kind of soul journey, we I think we kind of solved it, yeah. Yeah, I, I've seen the film four times, I, I know. <laughs> Where does this guy get four times uh, see one movie? But, Jen, well, what, what I was really able to keep, keep processing and absorbing with each time I saw the film was the blend in animation styles, specifically the CG animation, but also there is definitely a 2D animation element to this as well. So, A, uh, talk about that, the process of, of, of that hybrid, but also the, the evolution of animation since the first Puss in Boots movie 11 years ago. Yeah, like, you know, we always talk about how it's been like over a decade since that last Puss in Boots and even seeing the Shrek world. And Mark, you'd always talk about how like um, it, within that time, animation technology has evolved so much. So to use this opportunity to reintroduce Shrek's fairy tale world and even the style and aesthetics to, to give it a refreshing look to reintroduce the character we felt was very necessary. And then, um, you know, with with other amazing, like, movies like Spider-Verse that pushed the medium, we felt that, like, the DreamWorks team was inspired to take it up and step our game up as well. And especially with our, um, with our fairy tale world that we're telling, we felt that um, the, um, the, the storybook illustrative uh, aesthetic really lent itself to uh, the story that we're telling. And then Scott, to, to uh, talk about the animation um, philosophy behind that, like we were playing around with going between um, your traditional step 24 frames, or your sorry, your traditional 24 frames a second on ones to what we call stepped, like lower frame rate. Um, we played with that um, to um, kind of reflect uh, Puss's larger than life um, hyper reality and his superhero lifestyle. So we would go into those big action dynamic sequences in those stepped, um, the step storytelling of animation. And then for your more um, subtle performances, we go back to the traditional ones. So again, we Joel and I, we were always talking about, right, like 
we, we, we love so many things like anime and all these other art forms that we're passionate about, but we don't want to just throw them in just for the sake of being cool. There's always like a, a story point behind that and intention. Certainly, certainly. So, so Hater, when it comes to the score, you know, here's a film that regardless of the fact that it's a sequel or a later installment, it's a big film, it's a bold film. The, the animation is, is extremely uh, inspired and imaginative. Of course, you have a much, much bigger slate of characters. Everything about, about Puss in Boots, The Last Wish, is big. So what was your approach to approaching the score? I, th I think it's from, frankly, from a very small instrument. <laughs> um, uh, I played, in the Shrek movies, I played all the guitar solos when Antonio Banderas appeared. So I had that familiarity. Uh, Puss in Boots was already a friend. Um, but then, Gerno and Joel um, are very creative people. And in being like that, um, they were open for me to try um, all sorts of things. So to answer your question, I think at first it's a simple thing, it's a melody. Every character has its own melody. And then I, I make sure that those melodies can live together, they can hold hands. I try to make sure that each one of those melodies, they have very different sounds. So by the end of the movie, when they are all sharing the screen and all these melodies live together, and with their different colors, we get something like what you guys are talking about in terms of the texture of what one sees. I try to make sure that I just pay tribute and respect and love for what they've created with the story and visually too. So for example, for Wagner's character, the wolf starts very simple, generally, very simple, just a whistle. like a lullaby, but that becomes so monstrous and so big by the end of the movie that I was even scared when I heard <laughs> <laughs> the orchestra play. <laughs> so uh, I think uh, for me, this is, this is how you, you develop something so varied, so varied, so, so the worlds were so different. It's with the generosity and the artistic openness of all the filmmakers, you know, so these people here, uh, in the terminology, you know, that I use, basically they are very musical people, you know, and, and I could just give them all the music that I have inside. So, yeah, that's how yeah. it went. So, the great thing <laughs> about a great villain is that the villain doesn't think they're being a bad person <laughs> or a bad wolf. Uh, they think they're doing the right thing. They really believe that they are doing the right thing. So how did you approach voicing Big Bad Wolf? And, and how much experimentation and collaboration did you do before you like, okay, we know, how, we know what we're going to do with this now? Oh, a lot. We, we, <laughs> we, ex <laughs> we were just trying things there. I, was, I, I made sure that when I was going to record with uh, Joel in general, I was just, I, I just wanted to be open to whatever, you know, and the feeling that I had there with them was like that we were playing. I tell my kids, my kids are here, and I was, we were talking about that this morning. It's like, do I still, I asked them, do I still have, do I still play? Am I still like a, a guy who plays? My, does my brain work in a kid's playing mode? Which is a very important thing for all of us, I think, but in this case, I just allowed myself, Just I didn't prepare it at home, I, I wasn't like thinking. At some point, I even asked Joe, like, should the voice be something different? Like, hi, I'm the wolf! You know, like... <laughs> <laughs> and, we experimented, we and sure and did. We experimented, we, we tried so many things, and, and, and they were like, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> no, but we were really trying all the time. But like you said, the, the, this is a very special character because it's... Um, it's uh, the wolf is when I was a kid I was really scared of the wolf. The wolf is like was the, the most uh, one of the biggest villains of the fairy tales uh, world. It's a very scary character, but in this case, it's scary. But it has a bigger layer, which is like he's also there 
to teach something to Poos. Uh, the idea of mortality, it's like Joel said, this film is, um, has a very, very interesting concept. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, it's existential. It's uh, and it works in a. It's 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 funny and it's great to watch. And it's like kids are laughing all the time. But the uh, the existential part of it all, it's really amazing. I think it, the wolf brings a lot of that because he's the guy who's there not only to collect Puss's last life, but oh. to go like, live your life well, dude. You know, own it, deserved it. Yeah, you know, I'm curious because you have a lot of new characters in this film. So using Big Bad Wolf as an example and the collaboration and the experimentation, uh, what was that process like, that collaborative process like with, your, with the newer members of the cast using Big Bad Wolf in, as an example till you went like, that's it, that's it, that's the way to do it? Yeah, like um, I, I think like, like Wagner was saying, we, when we were recording, it's like, I mean, we, we were like, we felt like we were torturing you because we were like, but you were playing so much, but we we're like, just trying, just that first bar scene where he meets Puss and we were trying every variation um, because it was so important to us to find a character that wasn't Arch. Like you came in and said like, I don't want him to just be like a like an Arch villain. There's gotta be something to him. And um, I think like what, what you were just saying of like, the the unique thing in this is he's perceived as a villain, but the wolf isn't wrong. Puss is, and Puss's point of view is the thing that changes, and um, and so really kind of and and, and I think um, I remember we we were kind of like wow like I love your process Wagner because you're like yeah. like you know we're we're we have our our recording booths where. You're standing behind uh, the microphone, but like you were like pacing as we're like describing like why the wolf feels this way about puss in that opening, and he's like, this guy he doesn't appreciate life. That means he doesn't respect death. He doesn't respect you. And like Wagner is and Daniel does a great Antonio Banderas impression. Great, um, it's great. And uh, and I remember like you were walking toward Daniel since he was reading your counterpart, and. Like, man, the look you were staring at Daniel. I, I remember, yeah, like because you get so into the character and you were you were just communicating with me the subtext, but you just walked up to me and you're like, Okay, this is just how it is. I'm just I'm here to kill you. And I'm just gonna <laughs> kill you right now. And and I was like, he he's acting, right? Like in my head, like <laughs> But yeah, your, your but energy like it, it's amazing. It's, it's, Gotta hear your Antonio impersonation. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> <laughs> I put you on the, on the spot. spot. Come on, let's do yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I go, I go, and say, um, well, well, if it, yeah, <laughs> if it is in Pussing Boots himself, hey, good to meet you too. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the That's reading, really Mike. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being here at the Academy for this very special conversation about Puss in Boots, The Last Wish. Spread the word about the movie and have an amazing day. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, thank everyone. Everybody. Thanks, Scott. And thank you, Scott. Thank this you. Is, thank you all. Such a pleasure. <laughs>